All right, I'm so excited to be here. I was thinking about the first time I was at IHS. It was probably around 2010, and it was the first integrative conference I had ever gone to, and I just wasn't wasn't um, even aware of what I was going to encounter here. Um, the energy was palpable. I felt like I was with my people, right? This was just like the best, the best conference. And, you know, I remember, I think it was Jay Lombard that year that I remember sitting and listening to and thinking, oh, I can't wait to be up there and talk about something that I'm really passionate about. He's so passionate about what he talks about. He said, I want to do the, I want to do the same. And, um, well, here I am to talk about something that I'm not only passionate about, but I'm also a little bit obsessed with, I'll admit it, and that's mast cells. And it's hard not to be obsessed with them because they're really so important to look at when we look at all our chronically ill patients with multi-system disorders. And so, um, what I wanna talk about today. I have a lot of, a lot of things where I want to cover, um, but I'm going to start with some of the basics. Let me set the stage for what mast cells do when they are normal, when they, everybody has normal mast cells. So let's talk about what, what their function is. But then let's talk about mast cell activation syndrome, which is the dysfunction of mast cells. Let's, let's understand what happens when they become dysfunctional. We're gonna look at the various disorders that, that MCAS, dysfunctional mast cells, can cause. We're gonna look at uh, the nervous system and we're gonna discuss neuroinflammation. We're gonna look at things like chemical intolerance um, and a, a variety of other, other manifestations that we see of MCAS, because I think it's important that we look at all of it and not just think about the things that some people think mast cells are involved in, and that's just allergy. There's so much more. Um, I'm gonna end with um, a, uh, a case. Um, I, had, I did a brief uh, study of some patients in my practice. I'm gonna report the findings and then I'm gonna review a case so you get a sense of how I approach patients like this and give you some tools to bring back, back to the office on Monday. So I apologize if some of this is a, you know, a, a repeat of what you already know, but again, it's sort of nice to hear it again and again because it just kind of puts it together, makes it more easily, easy to understand the harder stuff of like why things are going awry. So mast cells are from the bone marrow. They, they're produced in the bone marrow, they're released into the bloodstream, and then they go into the tissue, the peripheral tissues. They're in the organs. They're in the, anything that's vascularized is where they are finishing up their maturation process. Um, and their maturation is, is controlled by their, their environment. And I think this is a very important point, and I'll hit on it a little bit uh, further along, but, you know, they, they can be, they can get mutated, they can get affected by epigenetic phenomena, and so where the mast cells are, what's happening, what they're exposed to, what kind of toxins, what kind of infections, et cetera, are going to, to control whether they stay normal or whether they become abnormal and aberrant. So there are a, a variety of um, receptors on the mast cell surface. Um, there are probably even maybe close to a thousand receptors. They can bind, allergens can bind, toxins can bind, um, lots, of, lots of things. Um, they synthesize these um, granules of cytokines and mediate, other mediators. There are probably over a thousand mediators that mast cells can make. Um, and you know, basically, the, the way mast cells work, uh, the one part of the way mast cells work is that they release um, the, their granules, their mediators, upon uh, a response to a trigger. Um, and the trigger could be anything, and we're going we're gonna to talk about that as well. They also have other functions that we don't talk about as much. They can actually phagocytize um, bacteria, metals, you know, foreign debris. Um, and they're really in high concentration at the interfaces of the environment. And they're there because they're part of the innate immune system, and they're there to, to protect us. 
So they're in every, every place that you can imagine that is going to have to deal with the environment is where, is where they are. And they're located where they can, they can um, locate pathogens. And I, and I bring that point up because while there are a lot of things that we talk about in, in, in the mast cell world that could be triggers for mast cell activation syndrome, the, the part of the focus of my practice is um, infection, and so uh, we know that they're involved. They're very heterogeneous, and I think this is an important point. Not all mast cells make all thousand mediators that I mentioned. Um, they're different. They can be different in, in within one patient. The mast cells in their gut could be releasing certain types of mediators. The mast cells in their respiratory tract could be producing other mediators. And so you, it's, it's actually sometimes very hard if when we think about eventually when we have to treat these patients, how we focus on them systemically when there may be differences within, within them and then between patients, of course. So they are associated, I mentioned they're in all tissue, but I want to make a point about um, that they are associated with, with blood vessels, lymphatics, smooth muscle. And so you can imagine the far-reaching effects their mediators can have affecting things like the flow of blood or lymph, secretion, contraction of many sites, influencing healing, proliferation, and remodeling. So I just want to, I want to point out this um, website. I encourage you all to check it out, cellstalk.com. It's essentially an encyclopedia for nerds, <laughs> encyclopedia of cytokines. And um, uh, we're working with this uh, Dr. Eibel Grofs, who has really put together this tremendous array of cytokines. But what's, what's really interesting is um, the mast cell portion of his encyclopedia, he has added, he has scoured the literature, he has found every reference to, to mast cells, and he has found over a thousand mast cell mediators and receptors. It's just really cool to pull it up and just see it. Now, I can't cover all of them, but this is just a little idea of some of the types of things that mast cells produce. And again, the effects they're going to have on the body are dependent on these particular mediators or cytokines. I think it was interesting how I think Dr. Patterson mentioned it this morning, that he's noticing a correlation between the cytokines that they're finding in COVID-19 and the symptomatology, right? So this, you could sort of say the same thing. There are these preformed mediators, they're like histamine, serotonin, um, they're gonna have a particular effect, vasoconstriction, vasodilatation. Um, and there are other types of cytokines that influence other cells, um, you know, basically uh, leading to, let's say, tissue infiltration of leukocytes, uh, growth and remodeling. So, you know, again, far, far reaching. So the heterogeneity of the mast cells, and I mentioned again that they're different in different parts of the body and they may be producing you know, different types of mediators. A lot of it has to do with the local environment that the mast cells are in. So in women, we see a, a, an association between um, hormonal shifts and, and mast cells. Actually, we would say the same for men, but just different, maybe different hormones. Um, but there are physiological conditions that can affect mast cells at baseline, and then we're going to talk about dysfunctional mast cells. So we know that hormonal shifts uh, affected pathologic conditions like infection, which I mentioned, um, and, and really epigenetics is really a, a really key player. This just gives you, an, an, you know, a quick overview. I have a lot of slides, and so you'll be feel free to, to check it all out later. But this is just an example of what, um, what mast cells can do, what they produce, and then the effects on the various organs. Now, in the immune system, because we're going to really concentrate on the immune system and the nervous system, to me, they're really very, very interconnected. You can't have one without the other. Um, so mast cells in the immune system talk to other, ma other cells, other immune cells. So they have that job as a, uh, in the innate immune system uh, where they're degranulating, releasing their chemicals, trying to fight 
you know, what, they're, what they see as foreign, but they also act in the adaptive immune system. And I think this is an important point because they can present antigen, for instance, to B cells, causing the production of antibodies. Some of those antibodies may not, autoantibodies actually, very often could be other antibodies, but some of those antibodies may not actually be functional antibodies. So the signal is sent from the mast cell to the B cell, you know, produce the antibody, and maybe th this is why in many of our patients that we're seeing increased levels of autoantibodies, increased ANA, um, et cetera, maybe, maybe some of it is driven by the mast cell. And there's some research to support that, that idea. Now, mast cells in the nervous system um, reside uh, near the nerve fibers. They really are, I, I like to visualize it. I draw this for my patients. I draw a nerve fiber and I draw the mast cells literally lining the nerve. And because it's visually, you can imagine that if the mast cell has a, has a degranulating event and there's a flare, it's gonna release these mediators. It's going to send the signal to the nerves it's gonna send the signal to the other cells in the, in the nervous system. They're going to release their cytokines and, and inflammatory mediators. And then there's going to be this, this back and forth, you know, vicious cycle essentially of inflammation. And I, and I have a, I think I have something here that sort of demonstrates the, how in this case, uh, a bacteria or virus, and we can replace that with, it could be Lyme, it could be COVID-19, how it affects the mast cell, how the mast cells then affect neurons, the microglia, the astrocytes, um, and, and again, the feedback back to the mast cell. You know, I thought of, I thought of the slide as I, was, as I was listening to Dr. Uh, Gordon this morning, because you know, he was talking about stress and trauma and how that affects us uh, on so many levels, right? Every, every organ in the body probably gets affected by, by trauma. In the nervous system, you can see how trauma, stress, activates these various parts of the nervous system, the astrocyte, the microglia, and the mast cell right there, all feeding back on each other. Again, leading, you know, again what's the end result? It's inflammation. And I just have some references for you there. You know, we have some, some literature um, that has, has looked at um, the effects of mast cell activation syndrome, um, so dysfunctional mast cells on neurologic and psychiatric diseases. Um, and what I wanna do, I wanna shift gears a little bit. I wanna give you a little bit of a historical perspective on mast cell activation syndrome, because it's really a new it's a new disease that was recently identified, but obviously probably has been around for much longer. But it sort of sets the stage for how we diagnose mast cell and, and the other things that we have to think about when we're, when we're looking at patients um, with this. So, you know, mast cell diseases um, include, commonly include, included allergy and, and mastocytosis, which is rare. That's sort of what we thought this was. And so 2007 was really the first report of mast cell activation syndrome. And then there were a consensus criteria that were put forth in like 2010 and 2012 that looked at like, how do we diagnose these patients? What, what is this syndrome really about? Um, and I think well, that was really uh, pioneering work. I think we've kind of gone beyond that at this point, which is good. But again, this is not that long. We've been talking about, you know, some of the things that we talk about here, Lyme disease, for, for longer than, you know, from 2010, right? So it's new, but it's clearly affecting a lot of people. And I would argue that, that the incidence is probably going to go up as our, um, as our world becomes more toxic, as, our, as we become, well, you know, more exposed to COVID and other infections. Um, so I think we, we, we better understand this better now, you know? Um, so they termed this, they finally came up with this term, MCAS. It was around 2010. And there's one study in 2013 that showed, and this is, I think, a really important uh, 
pioneering work by, by Dr. Gerd uh, Molderings in Germany, and I think that it hopefully will be replicated here. But he showed that in the general population, he wasn't looking at MCAS patients, he was looking at the general population and found that 17% had MCAS. Right? So if we extract, maybe we go up a little bit and we say maybe it's like 20% because did he really capture everybody? You know, one in five people could have MCAS and I would argue that in our population of patients, you know, it's half or more depending on, you know, my practice is 95%, but, but in many of yours it may be, you know, quite a number. And, and many of them are undiagnosed and not recognized. Um, I'm bringing, I want to bring up a, a couple of points with this. This is just sort of a classification system. So we have at the top M mast cell activation disease, and then under that we have this mastocytosis or cancer of the mast cell, and then we have the MCAS. And then we have various forms of MCAS, which I'm going to cover. But there are two other things that I wanted to bring up that I'm recognizing more and more in the last year or two, and that is this um, hereditary uh, syndrome, hereditary alpha tryptosemia, um, which is HAT. And there, there is a genetic test for that. And that is just an increased number of tryptase genes that, that basically code for tryptase. And so those patients have high levels of tryptase, but they don't have mastocytosis. They may have MCAS, but, but the point is that they, they may represent a slightly different population. And then autoinflammatory syndromes, which we've been testing a lot of our patients on, um, we think maybe also be, uh, is associated with MCAS, maybe a driver for MCAS. So I just wanted to make a point. The, um, the, the classifications, and, and it really depends on who you talk to about, about these classifications, but I like to think of it this way. There's primary MCAS, there's secondary, and then there's idiopathic. And primary would be, um, it's the root cause of the patient's problem. It best explains they are a constellation of, of symptoms, and, and it's monoclonal, meaning that there was a mutation that led to probably, probably in the bone marrow, that led to um, this, this clone, uh, or, or many clones of the mast cell, and, and it's causing, you know, we know what, what mediators it's producing and, and what effects it's having on the body. Secondary MCAS is really secondary, a secondary problem. So mast cell activation syndrome is occurring because of exposure to a toxin, an infection, uh, a medication, something that is driving activation of the mast cell, but that could be reversed if you eliminate the, the problem, right? So these are the patients that, that might have mast cell activation syndrome, let's say in Lyme disease, and we treat their Lyme and their MCAS improves. I would say the majority of my patients fall in the idiopathic. It's not clear, primary or secondary. I would argue that many of our patients have a predisposition to MCAS at baseline genetically, and then they've had a series of events over the course of their lifetime that has escalated it and brought them to the point where they're, they're seeing you. Now, there are three themes of MCAS. Now, again, a lot of people know about the allergic type um, or allergy, right? But I want to be very clear. Patients can have MCAS and have no allergic symptoms. You do not need that for, for the diagnosis. Generally speaking, the patients could have allergic phenomena, though. They may not. They could have, and I would say majority have inflammation. I mean, that by far to me is the overriding uh, symptom. It's inflammation in, in just about any, any organ. Um, but they can also have um, aberrant growth and development or dystrophisms. So I think of that as cyst growth, tumors, things that, uh, th you know, thyroid nodules, things that uh, shouldn't be growing but are growing abnormally. The mast cells probably have a role there. They play a role in normal growth. So abnormal mast cells, mast cells that are dysfunctional, will then have an issue with aberrant growth, right? So I like looking at it this way. What do they do at baseline? And then what do they do when they're, when they're activated inappropriately? So I, you know, an MCAS patient, 
must have symptoms consistent with chronic mast cell activation, which is abnormal at baseline and reactive to triggers. So the, there are patients that are completely normal at baseline, and then they have an event. So they were normal, they had COVID, they activated their mast cells and their macrophages and, and lots of other immune cells, and then they got better and they returned to baseline. Mas in mast cell activation syndrome, the patients probably have abnormal mast cells at baseline. They're always sort of on alert, and then there are these additional triggers Sometimes they're not identifiable, though, um, that, that will bring it out. Um, and, you know, we say that they should really have s symptoms in two, at least two organ systems, and they must not have some other disease that better accounts for the full range of observed symptoms and signs. They're usually, these patients are usually under the age of 20. The, again, I mentioned they're inflammatory, the symptoms wax and wane, and sometimes they have, there's no rhyme or reason for why they might be symptomatic now and they weren't yesterday. Sometimes they can identify triggers, sometimes they can't. But very often, there is a trigger in their life that they can identify with that that changed the course of the rest of their lives. So I, I love this cartoon. Uh, I'm going to give credit to Jill Brooks. She's a uh, nutritionist, and she's also a cartoonist. And this is what a mast cell patient feels like, right? So there are the triggers. There's so many triggers, and there's a you know, thousand symptoms. And, um, and am I multi-talented or what? It's really, it's really rough. These patients are, are sick. So what I want to do, I want to shift gears a little bit, and I want to start, I want to dive into the manifestations of mast cell activation syndrome. Um, and these are things that we see in our, in our, uh, our patients all the time. We'll do a little audience participation too, so, you know, that's coming up. Um, but um, we just published this um, with uh, Dr. Claudia Miller from the University of Texas on really looking at how mast cell activation syndrome may explain the cases of chemical intolerance, right? We know people who are sensitive to perfumes or smoke or gasoline or, you know, lots of things. Um, but what we wanted to look at is whether that could be explained by MCAS. And so what we did was we gave our patients a questionnaire, which I'm going to show you, called the Queasy, and we correlated their scores on the questionnaire with their diagnostic criteria. So if we diagnosed that with MCAS and they had a certain score on the Queasy, we saw that there was a high percentage of patients who had MCAS who also had high scores on the Queasy. You could be chemically intolerant and not have MCAS, we think, <laughs> and, 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 and vice versa. You could have MCAS and not be chemically intolerant, but the correlation between the two was really, really um, mind-blowing for, for us. It's what we suspected, but it was nice to find it. Um, and um, so I want to do the Breezy questionnaire with all of you. So the Queasy questionnaire is a 50-question uh, intake. Um, this is three questions. And I, wanna, I want you to raise your hand, if, if you don't mind, if you have any of these symptoms. So we'll start with question one. Do you feel sick? when you're exposed to tobacco smoke, certain fragrances, nail polish, gasoline, paint, paint thinners, cleaning supplies, new furniture, carpets. Um, by sick, we mean headaches, difficulty thinking, difficulty breathing, weakness, dizziness, upset stomach. Right, there are a few, right? Yeah. Are you, now question two, are you unable to tolerate or do you have adverse or allergic reactions to drugs or medications like antibiotics, um, painkillers, uh, contrast dye, birth control pills, implants, prostheses, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, fair number. Number three, are you unable to tolerate or do you have adverse reactions to foods such as dairy, wheat, corn, eggs, soy, caffeine, alcohol? Okay, so what I would recommend, since quite a number of you um, had, had your hands up for those, I would recommend that you do this first and then think about doing it with your patients. Go to queasy.org or tiltresearch.org. Um, 
Uh, tilt is toxicant-induced loss of tolerance. I'm going to explain. I'm going to show you a, a, a slide on that. Um, but they've done incredible work. Dr. Claudia Miller um, is, is the one that's sort of leading them. And she's put together these, the Breezy as a screening tool, the Queasy as a more comprehensive look. And then you can take that Queasy, and if you have a high score, you might want to look further at, as to whether you have MCAS or your patients do. This is a, an interesting uh, symptom store that they put together that once you have your queasy score, you can sort of outline it. And I think what's really interesting to see, you see the green area? This is sort of, they, want, they actually recommend you take the queasy test twice. First, you answer the questions before you got sick or before you noticed a change in your health, and then you answer it with what you know now about how you're, how you're, I'm sorry, how you're feeling, and then you, come, you can compare the scores. And so we have patients who know that there was an event, they got Lyme disease, they, lived, they were exposed to mold, whatever it is, um, and before that they can score, and they can see, they can be in the green and it's small, right? And then the symptoms expand dramatically um, after a particular trigger or exposure. So this is toxicant-induced loss of tolerance, which again, what we're saying now is that this is, this is probably, I mean, we can't say it because we haven't proved it in the literature yet, but this is what we're seeing in, in clinical practice, is that there's usually this susceptibility, okay? There's some genetic susceptibility um, that, again, I don't think we've identified yet, but this susceptible person has an, uh, an event, an exposure of some sort, again, in my practice, it could be mold, it could be a tick bite, it could be uh, COVID. You know, there, again, there's a large array, it could be a heavy metal exposure. They become, they lose their tolerance and they become the sensitive person. Now, the sensitive person doesn't need now as much of a trigger. It could be a low level um, exposure and it's just, they're sort of, you know, this is an iceberg, right? So it's sort of, they're underneath, you don't see it yet. And then there's some um, bigger event, trigger, that then brings it, the symptoms up to the surface. And those are the patients that, that we see. They're already, they've presented. And I would say this, this is exactly what we see in, in MCAS. These are the various triggers. Um, many of them are, I think, obvious. I thought what was really interesting about the work that they've done with the Queasy questionnaire, because it's a validated questionnaire, they found that the... Um, the, the initiators, the, the highest initiators for predicting chemical intolerance were actually implants, number one, pesticides, combustion products, mold, and you see, you see it go down, but implants, number one uh, predictor of whether they would develop chemical intolerance, and that's huge, right, because we're seeing a, a huge amount of implant illness. So the manifestations of, of mast cell activation disorder and syndrome are, again, every organ system, every symptom you can imagine. I'm not gonna go through each one, but you'll have those on, in the slides, but it is pronounced, right? It's, it's a lot. Um, and if we look at, because we're gonna dive into the nervous system um, a little bit more, we see that mast cells and, and MCAS are, is related to these pain syndromes. Um, they've, they've seen, we've seen it in migraines and uh, endometriosis and vulvodynia, fibromyalgia. There's this link between those mediators that the mast cells are producing, the effects on the nerves, and then the production of, of pain. We actually published on treating um, mast cell, using mast cell targeted treatment targeting underlying both pain syndromes for women as well as, th so dyspareunia, vaginitis, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. We showed that treating the, the mast cell actually has a, has a far-reaching effect on, on their symptoms, really relieving it. We had patients stop having you know, abnormal uterine bleeding. We've had patients stop having dyspareunia. So this is a great article if you wanna just look at our case, case series. So this is a, a really, this was a good article. It was really presenting a hypothesis about COVID-19 and MCAS. 
and I, and I think that this sort of sets the stage to how I want to think about um, uh, MCAS or how I want you to think about MCAS in, in your patients. Um, you know, we believe that MCAS may be one of the root causes of, of COVID, but we haven't proven it yet. That's why we need, you know, people like Bruce Patterson and others to do the research, and we hope that we'll be able to come closer to the answer. But I think what I want to make sure you understand is that, again, this is the distinction between normal and abnormal, right? Everyone has normal mast cells. Some people have normal mast cells and dysfunctional mast cells. Um, and so in this case, they looked at if you had at baseline a healthy patient, a patient who did not know they had MCAS, and a patient who was treated already, knew they had MCAS and treated, what would happen, what, what they were seeing with COVID patients. And so what they found was that at baseline, the people who were uh, untreated MCAS, they didn't know they had it, they had at baseline uh, activated um, inappropriately activated mast cells, even at baseline. They didn't know it, and they were the same as, as the diagnosed patients, except the diagnosed patients, because they were on treatment, had better control of their abnormal mast cells. And then they got COVID, and what they found was that the healthy people, because they didn't have abnormal mast cells, had a normal response um, to, to COVID and then, and then recovered. The, the patients who did not know they had MCAS had, um, uh, had appropriately, they, again, appropriate mast cells if they were normal, but the dysfunctional mast cells were inappropriately activated, overactivated, releasing cytokines, right? That's just the cytokine storm that everyone talks about. And then at, after recovery, they're actually, their mast cells do not return to normal as they would in a normal person. They continue to be activated. And the patients who are controlled with MCAS, they found that, that at the end, they were more controlled through the, through the illness. And this is what we're seeing in our patient population. You know, we don't see a lot of our patients getting long-haul COVID, because they're, they've actually, if they've been in my practice, they've been pretty well controlled. They're not perfect, right? We have patients who are still very ill, but they have some things on board to help, um, whereas the patients that I'm seeing who I haven't been treating, who have COVID, who have post-COVID syndrome, and are coming to see us because they're suspicious that there's something going on with their immune system, we're finding that they probably had MCAS at, at before, they didn't know it, and, and now they're, they're still sick. So this is a big piece of the, of the puzzle. In thinking about the same thing we, we think about with COVID or any trigger on the mast cell, um, we, we also looked at, we just published this uh, last month, I think, um, looking at, this was a case series of um, post-HPV, post-Gardasil uh, vaccine and the escalation of mast cell activation syndrome. So sort of the same way to think of it, these were patients who we only saw after they were really sick, but when we took a really thorough history, what we found is that these patients probably had underlying MCAS, untreated, maybe mild, not affecting them. Then they had the vaccine, and for some of these patients, it wasn't until the third in the series, some of those patients had effects after the first one, that they then developed POTS. You've heard POTS mentioned a few times, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is a dysautonomia. It's an issue with the autonomic syndrome system. And um, they developed POTS, and then over time, they were finally diagnosed with MCAS, because they came to us and we, we, we diagnosed them. But what we found was that, again, they had MCAS, probably, can't prove it. They had an event. And then, actually, the, our theory is really that MCAS is the driver of POTS. It's the mast cells in the nervous system, in the autonomic nervous system, that is then releasing its mediators, causing the nerves to react, and, um, and then having an effect on the blood vessels, et cetera. It's a, it's a complex... Um, you know, process. So um, again, I think of it, I think it's important when we think about our patients that we always go back in time and understand what they were like before, what the trigger is, what they have now, and then how do we, obviously, how do we treat it? So 
you know, I want to spend a little bit of time on, um, on diagnosis of, of MCAS because there's a lot of misinformation. Um, and there's also a little bit of, um, I, I equate this to the Lyme world, it's a little bit of two sides to the story, two sides here, right? So there's a group, um, you know, really pioneers in the MCAS world who have come out with what, they're, what we're sort of terming the consensus one criteria for how to diagnose MCAS. And they have very specific um, guidelines. They're very similar to what I'll talk about um, my, my group, which is the consensus two. Um, but the important point that I'm going to bring up is triptase. Because one of the, the, I think, the most common question that I get asked by practitioners when they reach out to me for help with patients is about the triptase. They say, well, their tryptase isn't elevated, so based on this criteria, they don't have MCAS. And again, this is one way of looking at tryptase. We, we challenge the view of tryptase, and we published this a couple of years ago, I think it was 2020, um, where we, we presented another way to look at diagnosis not using tryptase. And, ag and again, um, there are so many mediators that mast cells make that if we rely on tryptase only, we're sort of missing the boat. We know that they're making a thousand chemicals or more. So, um, so our way of looking at it is, is looking, having the ability to use all the different type of mediators that we can test for. There are lots that we can test for. Um, and if you have an elevation in these mediators, and you have a clinical picture that's suggestive of this, and they have that general, one of those three themes that I mentioned, allergic or, or inflammatory or dystrophic, um, then that supports the diagnosis. Heparin is probably the most um, specific mast cell mediator. Um, and you know, it's one that I have found to be the, the, the one piece of um, evidence that I can use to support the diagnosis. Very often, these patients have negative histamine levels, and you think, oh, how is this possible? How can they have MCAS and not have elevated histamine? Well, it's because that's not one of the mediators their mast cells are making, or we can't capture it at the time. So heparin is so specific. Um, and, and if you think about what heparin does, right, it's a blood thinner. It's being, being produced by abnormal mast cells, right, not normal, abnormal. Um, and, you know, think about the things that, that could happen. So if the mast cells in the uterus are producing uh, uh, heparin, right, you're going to have dysfunctional uterine bleeding or heavy periods. Um, it may affect um, other, other bleeding issues or other clotting issues, right? So, um, so I love that. It's hard to test for. You have to have the right lab. Uh, but I want to mention that because it's, I think, far more important than triptase. This is just for you. This will be in your slides, just the things that you want to test for for diagnosis. Um, and, and biopsy staining, always encouraged as well to look for mast cells. So I won't belabor the point on tryptase, but, but basically all mast cells have tryptase. So if you have mastocytosis and you have the cancer of the mast cell, you're going to have a lot of tryptase. Um, and, but, but other than that, it's very variable. And so a very small percentage of our patients actually have a tryptase issue, and they might even have this hereditary problem, HAT. So I think about... The diagnosis of MCAS, right? You want to, you should be, consider it in patients who have failed to find any other evident disease, better explaining their full range of findings. You're going to look at the physical exam. They might have dermatographism. You know, scr the scratch test produces a wheel. They may have other findings. They may be hypermobile. There are other, other associated diseases that we see. They may have POTS. And then you want laboratory data. And it has to be consistent with chronic aberrant mast cell mediator expression. You'd like to see response to intervention. You know, usually before I'm even waiting for anything to come back, I'm starting them on something because if they get better, that helps, you know, in thinking about it. We have a questionnaire that we give, and we're, we're giving the queasy, that queasy questionnaire to everybody. I think it's really important. Helps us understand them better. Um, so I'm not going to go through every, every like, minute, minute um, uh, aspect of the treatment. It's very, I can spend, you know, two hours probably just talking about like five drugs on this list. Um, but I want to just make a point that 
since we mentioned, since I mentioned earlier that mast cells are different, they're heterogeneous, they make different mediators, the treatment is going to be different in each patient and even between the different organs or different systems in their body. So you might find something that works for their mast cells in their respiratory tract, but that might not be the one that's gonna work in their GI tract or their nervous system. So it's complicated. Everything has to be done one thing at a time. And I, I would say that probably like the basic stuff that we use if we're looking at pharmacologic, I'll mention the non-pharmacologic too, but if we talk about pharmacologic, you know, we think about um, H1, antihistamines that block the H1 receptor. We think about H2. Um, we trial and error each one. We even compound them. Again, these patients are sensitive, right? So they may be sensitive to a, a, an excipient in a pill. Uh, it could be the dye, right? I can't believe that they use so much dye in, in, in so many of the pills on the, on the market, right? But there are other ingredients, magnesium stearate, microcrystalline cellulose, the list goes on. And so sometimes if you have patients who are not responding, you have to look and say, is it the drug they're not responding to, or are they, are they re reacting to the drug, or are they reacting to something else? So it's a lot of work. It's really, um, it, takes, it takes time. And the patients have to start to learn to recognize things themselves. We use leukotriene inhibitors because leukotriene is a mediator that mast cells make. Um, we, use, we use a lot of low-dose naltrexone, um, which I know Dr. Horowitz mentioned before, I think. Um, you know, aspirin could be, could be good, could be bad, really depends on the patient. All of these things really are like that. We try to avoid steroids, but sometimes it's inevitable. Um, you know, the mast cell stabilizers, uh, chromalin, ketodafin, um, and even actually hydroxyurea could be in that class. Um, I don't use that as much, but chromalin, ketodafin definitely is a big, big part of the practice. But again, I can't predict who's gonna to react to, to what, in which way. So it's really, it's frustrating. Patients wanna get better yesterday, you have to work your way through it. Some respond to Zolaire, that's a monoclonal IG antibody, imatinib, which is a mastocytosis, uh, we'll call it a chemotherapy agent, might have an effect as a tyrosine kinase inhibitor. And then there are lots of non-pharmacologic treatment, and some of the stuff we're doing simultaneously, or we're thinking about first, we're setting the foundation of their health. You know, we're, we're thinking about their diet, we're thinking about reducing inflammation, they may have issues with, with methylation, which is one of the ways histamine is, is metabolized. You know, there are definitely pros and cons to the histamine diet, people ask me all the time. Um, whether, you know, what's the diet, what, what should they do? I don't even have, we don't have it on our website. We don't, we don't promote it because everything has to be personalized and individualized. Um, you know, and again, there are a number of other products and things that we use um, pretty routinely, but, you know, one thing at a time. And here are some references. And so again, even the monsters uh, don't, don't understand why they designed this low histamine diet. It, can be, it has to be inconvenient, confusing, and frustrating, absolutely. If your patients ever asked you, you know, why there are like five different histamine diets, uh, uh, histamine diet diets online, right? And they're all they're all different. So now I want to look at uh, the study that really looked at mast cell activation syndrome and neuroinflammation and immunity. So this was just a, a case review in my of my patients. We looked at eight patients, and actually. You know, this was for, I believe I did the slide deck for the 2020 or 2021 um, IHS conference. So these slides are actually a little bit old because I probably have, I have definitely have more than eight patients. But I looked at um, these patients between five and ages five and 25. And, and it, we looked at patients who had been evaluated for persistent neuropsychiatric illness who were unresponsive to traditional psychiatric medication. Right, so these are the patients, they've been to the psychiatrist, they've been hospitalized, nothing works. Um, and um, we did, and then we looked at mast cell activation syndrome. So we tested them for it. And then we also looked at autoimmune markers. We looked at antineuronal antibodies. We looked at other markers for inflammation. And what we found was that all patients, so again, small number, but all patients had confirmed mast cell activation syndrome according to the consensus two criteria. Um, all patients had at least one autoantibody 
Six of the eight of them had neuronal and antineuronal antibodies. And that when we targeted the mast cell, mast cell targeted therapy um, led to significant improvement in the neuropsychiatric illness. And so what I thought I would do, since I have a little time, um, I'd like to run through a case um, that demonstrates this so that you understand how I approach patients like this. This is a 11-year-old um, boy I saw for the first time in October of 2018, and he had um, recurrent fevers, severe fatigue, leg pain, insomnia, and brain fog for a year. He had his, you know, I, I always go back to the history before birth, the, the health of the mother. Um, so he had some early stuff, you know, he was, he was you know, uh, delivered C-section. Um, he was breastfed for a year, but the mother really struggled with her diet. He was sensitive to everything she ate, you know, soy, eggs, everything. She eliminated everything. He had blood in the stool, so he had a milk protein allergy. But the history was that he was developmentally normal and, and actually met his milestones early. Now, in retrospect, there are some questions, actually, about about sort of his development, but, but at least physically he was developing normally. Um, he had a lot of problems early on in life, what, introducing food, he, was, he, he developed seasonal allergies. Again, he's become the sensitive kid. You know, he's starting, he, you know, the mother describes the, the socks have to be a certain way and the pants have to be sweats and, you know, he's, you know, um, sensitive. <laughs> so, um, nope. Right, okay. So, wait, did I miss? Okay. Um, so at age three, he developed, um, you know, recurrent ear infections and then needed the uh, tympanostomy tubes placed. And then um, he, somewhere shortly after that, he developed a cholesteatoma and then needed, like, this really profound surgery for a very, you know, young child um, where they used implant material. They used titanium and synthetic material to recreate the bones. And then he um, lost his hearing. Uh, he regained hearing, thankfully, but then needed tubes placed again. When I met him in 2018, he still had, he still had the tubes. There was some history of a questionable bullseye rash. He wasn't diagnosed with it at the time. The parents believed that's what it was in retrospect, but he was never treated. So again, I saw him at age 11. This was at age four. Um, and um, the symptoms started about a year before I saw him, and he had these random fevers. Um, he was having more difficulty going to school. He couldn't do his normal activities. And then he started getting sick a lot. So he got parvovirus on top of what he was dealing with already. And then he had a head trauma, right? So, so you're hearing, you should be hearing the common theme here, and that is that there's, um, there's an event, and then there's stabilization, and then there's another event. And, and this is a big event, right? A TBI is, 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 is major, young, young child, brain developing, inflammation. There's tons of mast cells in the brain, right? Um, and he's told he doesn't have a concussion, but he probably did. Um, and then he developed tinnitus um, that, uh, that really um, continued until I saw him and really was the, the, the point at which that all his entire condition worsened where he was sort of dealing with the symptoms on some level. When I saw him, he um, actually also had a hearing aid because he did lose hearing in that ear that had regained it originally. He continued with fevers. He got the flu. The pediatrician said, I don't know what to do. Maybe, maybe it is Lyme, so I'll put you on Doxy. Maybe it helped. Maybe it didn't. It wasn't clear. Um, you know, his diet, he was really, really irritable and very hard to get good food into him. Um, the family history is interesting, right? This is what I always like to look at, you know, the genetic piece, right? The mother says, oh, yeah, I'm sensitive, and I have allergies. Oh, I fainted a few times, and I'm really hypermobile, and my knees pop. Um, we know that there's an association between connective tissue issues and mast cell activation, so that's where the, the flag goes off. Um, so then um, the father also had some autoimmune issues, thyroid nodule, um, white matter changes on his MRI, very nonspecific. Um, and his, his sister had some gut issues. At the time I saw him, I wasn't seeing the sister, but then I've since started seeing the sister who really probably is now worse than, than he was. So she had her turn and now had a bunch of triggering events that we're trying to deal with now. 
Um, they were living, when I met them, they were living in mold. But it wasn't so apparent. I mean, I think they minimized it. Um, they were going to move. So at the, in the beginning, you know, we, I always pay attention to mold, but they, they really didn't think it was a big deal, except that he was really in this moldy home all day because he was being homeschooled. Um, you know, on review of systems, I mean, I just could go on and on. Every, every part of his bo poor body was, was suffering. He was pale. He was lethargic. He had lymphadenopathy. He had mild dermatographism, and he was, he was hypermobile but didn't meet criteria for EDS or Los Danlos. His lab work was really, really um, interesting and concerning because I thought, and here's, here's going to be the take-home message. I thought this was the answer. Okay, I said, this is it. I told the parents, we found it. He's PCR positive for Lyme. He's had exposure to Borrelia miyamotoi. He ha you know, has exposure to Bartonella hensley. He has an antibody. Whether it's active or not, I don't know, but given the PCR for the Lyme, it's, it's possible that these are all active. And, um, and his initial MCAS testing was negative. So I thought, all right, all right, I know where we're going with this. And because he had, he was having a lot of um, neurologic symptoms and really trouble concentrating, I did the Cunningham panel, which is an uh, anti-neuronal antibody panel that looks at the antibodies that may be responsible for neuropsychiatric um, issues. And he had, here's an example of his, his uh, molecular test. We, we had you know, elevation of inflammatory markers, basically. So his brain is on fire. He has, you know, Lyme disease. He also had strep antibodies and NANA and low vitamin D and, you know, and dysbiosis, right? So this is, these are the, this is the type of patient that, that we see. It's so complex, right? I think about, I use this analogy all the time with my patients. You have an onion and you have the layers of the onion and you've got to peel each layer at a time. And what I think may be the top layer of the onion may turn out not to be that, the case. So we started, you know, I always start with the foundation. Got to work on his diet a little bit as much as we can. Um, he's a kid and he's, he's stubborn and he's sensitive and he's sensitive to, to, to food textures and all that. But we got to start working. We got to cut some things out. He needs vitamin D because, like, number one thing that we can do for his immune system, mast cells have vitamin D receptors on their surface. Okay. You know, I don't know if he has MCAS, but vitamin D is not going not gonna to hurt, and he needs it, right? I'm going to monitor his levels. I'm working on his gut. I'm working on his inflammation. And I said to the parents, we've got to figure out what's going on in the house. So we did mycotoxin testing, which was off the chart. They go back. They do the testing on this home, and it was a rental home, and they were renting basically with the intention to buy a house eventually, which they thought was going to be sooner rather than later. But in any case, the house was a mess. They're actually now dealing with the landlord, and that's a whole other thing. I feel bad, bad for them. It, the, the house was basically needs to be gutted. But they moved out, thankfully, and he really started to improve. All the things we were doing were moving the needle a little bit. He noticed you know, that he was a little bit different, but he was still very dysregulated, very difficult. He couldn't get along with his siblings. He was, um, he was having trouble in school with, with others. He was having these outbursts. So he said, all right, you know what, well, maybe we need to start treating the mold. Right? So we did, I did some of the mold protocols, binders, other things. He started getting hives and allergic symptoms, which he hadn't had before. So we kept trying different things. He kept reacting to different things. We wound up on, with some homeopathy because the mother really was tr struggling with how he was doing, and she was so afraid of making him worse with everything that we had tried. Um, and maybe, maybe it helped a little bit, right? So... You know, we're always going back. Like, what are we missing? What are we missing? He was maybe kind of stable for a little bit. And then he started having suicidal ideation and, and depression. And, and this is an 11-year-old, right? The mother said, this is, something is wrong. Um, and the psychologist that he was seeing was doing this type of um, therapy with him. And she said to me, I'm sure this has been going on for longer. I just know that this, yes, he's had these triggering events. But I'm telling you that there is something with his, his nervous system is just different, you know, maybe not neurotypical. That's not bad. It just is. And then, you know, the light bulb went off and I said, we got to go back. We got to go back and think about mast cell activation syndrome. I know I did some testing and it was negative. It's okay. It happens. Let's do it again. Because the history was just starting to sound. He was reacting to everything. He wasn't responding to treatments. 
and I, I don't know if I, I may have glanced over that really quickly, but I, I treated him with antibiotics too for, for the Lyme. I mean, we did, we did various things, herbs and, and antibiotics. It was impossible to get him on anything. So we did the testing, and he did have um, twice, we were able to, to isolate a histamine, elevated histamine level. I could not find any other mediator in him, but I thought, well, I've got two. I'd like to confirm twice, and I have the clinical picture. Um, so let's, you know, let's do this. And I put him on a quercetin bromelain NAC combination chewable pill, and that he really started he cut it into four pieces. He would chew a little bit. It took months to titrate him up. But he got to the point after a few months that if he skipped a dosage, he knew the difference. And actually, his family knew the difference. And they would see him starting to become a little bit dysregulated. And they, did you take your <laughs> quercetin? Um, so it was good. You know, we tried. It was good. It was not perfect, though. Uh, we tried all these other mast cell targeted therapies. Again, not tolerated. We compounded. We did a lot of things. And then I said to the mother, "Okay, you know what? We're going to go. We're going to try chromalin, because what I'm seeing, and again, this is anecdotal. What I'm seeing is that chromalin, while it's not absorbed in the into the, the system, the, the general into the body, basically, it stays in the in the GI tract." Um, for some reason, there's this, this effect it's having on the mast cells in the gut that is having an effect on the mast cells in the nervous system. Well, that's the, I say for some reason, but right, it's the gut-brain connection. So let's treat the gut with the chromalin and let's see what happens. And I titrate chromalin really slowly. I, I know that the prescription can be written one vial, it's a liquid if those of you don't know, one vial four times a day. And I've seen patients who've come to me from other doctors and they said, I couldn't take chromalin. My doctor told me to take it four times a day and it made me so sick. You cannot start it four times a day. It does cause what we consider is like a tachyphylaxis. It will make the mast cells more reactive, more de they degranulate further before it actually stabilizes them. So we go super slow. I'll have them take a vial in water, I might tell them, you know what, make it eight ounces, measure it, and maybe you start with a half an ounce or an ounce of that preparation. We're gonna go slow until your mast cells know what's happening, and then we'll, you know, we'll go up. And that's what we did, and he titrated up, and all he is taking was one vial of this. It took, a, it took a month or two to get up to that. And it is, in the mother's words, a game changer. He starts skiing. In fact, the reason I knew it was a game changer is she sent me a video of him on the ski slopes, right? It was just like I wanted to cry. I mean, when you see this, this kid could barely stand, could barely move when I saw him in the office. Now he's skiing. He, he went back to school. He's happy. He's playing. He, he's making friends. He has no joint pain, leg pain. This was really the thing that, that, that was most bothersome to him. Um, one of the things we sometimes see rarely with, with chromalin is constipation. And um, we just cleaned up his diet a little bit and increased his water, and actually it was okay. So these are my pearls. Please get a comprehensive history from birth. Think about all those triggers. Consider MCAS in the patients that, that earlier evaluations didn't reveal a specific um, disease or diagnosis. Um, the choice of intervention cannot be determined based on symptoms. Um, they could be based on mediators. So if you had a histamine, you could try going after the histamine. But you really can't. There's no way to know what's really going to work other than some of the anecdotal stuff that I see. Um, there's no way to predict the response to particular treatment uh, either. And really, one thing at a time. And it could be one thing once a month. It could be one thing once a week. You really have to work with the patients you know, very, very carefully. So given the profound, ma that, given the profound ma effects mast cells have within both the innate and the adaptive immune systems and their diffuse distribution throughout the body, it's not surprising that, that the literature and our growing clinical experience supports MCAS as a potential driver for the development of autoantibodies with or without true autoimmune disease and a broad range of neuropsychiatric manifestations. So again, this child did not have an autoimmune disease. He had autoimmune markers 
that, were, that we believe were driven by the underlying mast cell activation syndrome. Um, so um, we're really, though, only at the tip of the iceberg, and I would argue that we're at the bottom of the roller coaster because you can just see how from 1993 to 2020, all the different diseases and all the associated diseases we're finding, and we're just gonna, we're just gonna keep going, unfortunately. Um, so I'll, I'll end here. I do wanna say one thing. I, we, are, we are hosting, I'm hosting, along with Dr. Larry Afrin, a mast cell conference, it's a mast cell workshop, June 23rd through June 26th, um, in Briarcliff Manor, it's in Westchester County. Um, it's gonna be three days, three and a half days of really intense mast cell um, work. We're gonna be hearing uh, a, a wide variety of, on, on a wide variety of topics related to MCAS. There's gonna be talks about things like craniocervical instability and connective tissue disorders, genetics, I mean, we're, POTS, we're, we're really scanning, we're, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be a very comprehensive look at MCAS as it manifests in various disorders. It's a small group. We're expecting about 60 people. We do have limited space available. We have a few slots available. If anybody is interested, just come and talk to me. So I think we have like 30 seconds for questions, <laughs> but I'll, I'll end there. I think it's the excipients. You know, Singular is pink in a lot of the generics. I think the brand is pink. There's all, you know, so there's dye in there and there's a lot of excipients. So we've been entertaining that theory that there probably is something that that, that compound Montelukast is doing that, that might be causing the depression in that set, set of patients, but it's probably doing it through the mast cell, I think. And, and then the reactions, the other reactions that, that people are getting to Singular may be the excipients. And then the depression may be the excipients as well. It's a good question. Any, any correlation between abnormal GGT levels and impacts? Yeah. So with GGT, sometimes you see fatty liver with that, right? Are you talking about fatty liver or just, yeah? Well, general. general. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah, elevated LFTs for no reason. Very common. Elevated LFTs in response to some intervention we've done very often, like things that you wouldn't think. You know, you give them a herb or something, you know, really benign and their LFTs go up and you think, how is that possible? And I would look at that as a mast cell reaction, but yeah, it's very common. There's so many mast cells in the GI tract and the liver. Yeah, it's a good question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so, you know, the bladder also has, is lined, I think about every organ, it's lined with mast cells, um, and, and there are gonna be various triggers um, that could set it off. You know, why a person develops interstitial cystitis in the first place, we don't always know, but, but, but the majority of the patients, I don't know if I can say 100%, but I would say a majority, have underlying mast cell activation syndrome. They've had some, some event, some trigger. The mast cells in their bladder got, you know, basically um, got, got the, the brunt of it for whatever, for whatever reason. This is the other thing we don't know. I don't know why it affects somebody's bladder and affects somebody else's GI tract or, or whatever. Um, but, but the focus is, well, I di try to diagnose it, you know, if they have, they have MCAS and we try to target it. So you can um, do 
more benign things like just trying the various H1, H2 blockers, you know, the variety of, of mast cell targeted treatment. We've had patients do installation, you know, into the bladder of things like chromalin. They don't do it on their own, obviously. With, with working with a urologist, you know, th we've done things where we ha have to get the mast cell drug actually in the bladder to, to calm it down. We've seen that. Diet plays a role. I mean, there's so many factors. But yeah, the mast cells are key there. I don't know if I answered your question, but yeah. Anything else? Yeah, I can't see. Oh, I can't see. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yes, yes. So the mast cells, you know, to I'm sorry? Oh, sorry, yeah. Uh, she asked about eosinophils and whether there's an association between high eosinophils in MCAS and also eosinophilic um, cationic prote protein, right? Is it ECP? Is that right? So, so mast cells, you know, I mentioned they talk to other cells in the, in the um, immune system, right? B cells, T cells. They also interact with the eosinophils. And so, um, so yes, there's a subset of patients where the mast cell disease will cause increased numbers of eosinophils. They may get eosinophilic esophagitis. They may have elevated levels of the ECP. Um, what's really interesting is that um, eosinophilic esophagitis is, is treated, well, I don't know if that was your question specifically, but let's, if we talk about a disorder involving high eosinophils, a lot of, you know, the, the treatment is steroids, PPIs, I don't know, they don't, it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me, they don't always t take them off of gluten and they don't always change their diet, but um, in my patient population, if they have EOE, we're going in, we're changing their diet, we're treating their mast cell disease, and if their biopsy showed high numbers of the eosinophils, we tell them to go back, we tell the pathologist to go back and look at the mast cells, and then we usually can confirm that there are a lot of mast cells along with the eosinophils, and so we treat that, um, and, um, and actually they, you know, they get better without the PPI that, that they always want to use for that. I am so sorry, we actually need to wrap up this session as we gotta move on to the next very exciting session. Thank you so much, Dr. I'll Jensen. Be, I'll be outside if anybody wants to talk.